Hello video viewers, hello listeners, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Here's a new episode of Luke's English Podcast. In fact, this is episode number 763 and it's called Rambling in the New Pod Room and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just going to spend this episode uh, in my pod room, of course, and I'm just going to talk about the room. This is the first episode that I've ever recorded in my new room, so I'm just basically going to introduce you to the room give you a little tour although there's not much there's not much to see because it's a very small room but I'll show you around and give you a sense of what the room is like for me uh, and I'm going to ramble it's a ramble challenge I've got some rules for my ramble some ramble rules and maybe I'll read some pages from a couple of books on the shelves and just generally have a bit of a ramble it's one of those episodes before we start properly let me just remind you that if you are looking for private lessons with a one-to-one -one teacher with a qualified teacher of English to improve your speaking, your pronunciation, your grammar, your vocab, or uh, to prepare for things like an exam or job interview. If you're looking for one-to-one -one lessons with a qualified one-to-one -one teacher online, then check out the British Council. They have a service now where you can look at different teachers, check out their profiles, choose the one that matches you, and then start having lessons with that person. The service is called British Council English Score Tutors, and yeah, it works exactly like that because it's online. You can do it from the comfort of your own home. There are teachers in many places, so you'll find one in your time zone. And the way it works is that um, the British Council are offering you uh, your first lesson, a sort of test lesson, a trial lesson, so you can see what the service is like. They'll offer that to you for one dollar. And uh, if you like it, then you can you know, buy some lessons. And if you do buy some lessons, you'll get a free lesson included because you listen to my podcast. Okay, so you can test it out if you like for just $1, no pressure, you don't have to continue. Uh, but if you choose to and you buy some lessons, you'll get a free lesson included. And if you want to get the offer and find out the details, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash English teacherluke.co.uk slash English and the link is in the description of this episode. That's British Council English School Tutors for one-to-one -one private lessons online. Right, so let's start this, this episode properly then. Uh, welcome to my new pod room. So this is a chance for me to uh, just kind of let loose and have a bit of a ramble uh, uh, while inviting you to this kind of housewarming party, although then this might be just the first part of the party and I'm planning to invite some other people in here too to properly uh, sort of uh, warm up the room as it were. Um, in this one I'm going to welcome you to the new room and do a ramble challenge in which I am restricted to only talking about things inside this room. Okay, so a ramble. I think if you are a long-term listener then you'll know what I mean when I talk about a rambling episode. It's where I just talk off the top of my head without really planning a lot of things in advance. It can be a bit of a challenge for me to be able to keep talking, but that's the sort of, that's the fun part, to see if I can keep going without stopping or without going, uh, or without losing my train of thought completely. I have to keep this coherent and I have to keep the English flowing constantly for, well, the duration of an episode without stopping at all. And I've got to make sure it makes sense as well. Now I do have some rules for this episode. Here are the rules. So first of all, I have to welcome everyone to the pod room. Uh, secondly, I have to give a tour of the room. Thirdly, I am restricted to only talking about things inside this room. So, um, you know, I'm not allowed to refer to things going on outside. Um, and uh, I can maybe describe some, some items on the walls, pictures and other objects. Um, and I have to include some descriptive language, so let's see what I come up with in terms of describing the things around me. And uh, I have to pick up uh, a, a book and do a random exercise from it. So I've got various books, uh, some of them are books for teaching English, so if I pick one of those out I have to do a random page of exercises from it, sort of grammar or vocabulary or something. So there will be some language teaching in this. And also, if I pick any other book, I've got to read a random passage from the book and maybe explain what's in it. Um, and basically, I have to keep talking uh, without pausing and without saying er uh, 
and I have to try to keep it coherent uh, if possible. Okay, so that's the challenge. Let's try and do this. Your challenge is to keep up with this, uh, to listen and understand. And uh, if I do exercises from a, a book, then your challenge is to try to, uh, you know, try and understand the answers, try and learn a few things as I put my headphones in so I can monitor the sound quality. So welcome, welcome to my new pod room. Here we are. It's actually happened. Now, um, I don't, I still don't have electricity in here, even though you can see if you're watching the video version on YouTube, you can see a light in the background. Um, but <laughs> the room still doesn't have electricity. I mean, if you if you listen to uh, all my episodes and you listen until the end of the episodes, then you will probably have heard me talking about um, the situation with the electricity and the internet in this room. And uh, <laughs> um, so, shall I go into it? I'll, I'll give you the, the, the very brief version of the electricity situation. So first of all, okay, obviously we bought this room and uh, uh, to use as an office. And then after a long time, finally uh, contacted the electricity company. They arranged for a guy to come and do a sort of a survey. So he, he came, I had to meet him. He came to check the room. I told him exactly what I wanted. And he did a sort of, uh, you know, a sort of a survey and then sent me a quote for how much he expected the work to cost. Okay, so that was basically me saying, okay, so uh, I want a plug there, I want a double plug there, a double plug there, a single plug there, and a single plug over there, please. And this one, I want it to be controlled by a switch on the wall. Also, the room needs to be earthed. We need to connect the room to the earth so that it's safe. Okay, uh, there you go. And he looked around, <laughs> noted it all down. He said, okay, great, thank you very much. I'll be in touch. How long? A week, two weeks, maybe two weeks later? He came to fit the stuff and it took him two days, right? Uh, the second day after he'd fitted the plugs, he said to me, oh, um, there's there's some equipment missing, um, I'm afraid. There's, there's a few things missing, so I'm going to have to come back next week. So this was on a Friday, at the end of the day on a Friday. So I was like, okay, he's going to have to come back next week. He said, probably Monday. And I said, okay, great. Uh, I finish work in the uh, at lunchtime on Monday so you can come in the afternoon. Monday comes, I text him and say, let me know when you're going to arrive. And he said, oh, you know, it's not going to be today. Um, uh, it's probably more like Friday. Okay, so uh, that's a week after he initially came. So a week after he came to finish the job. Um, and uh, in fact, he did he come on that Friday? I think maybe he even came later. But anyway, he came back, finished the job, and I signed. And then... I said to him, so how long will it be then before I can actually switch the electricity on? And he said, oh, well, um, uh, someone else needs to come out and, uh, and uh, check my work. And he said, that'll probably be seven to ten days. Now, ten days basically means two weeks, doesn't it? I mean, pretty much. It's like ten working days. That's two weeks. So I still, I'm still waiting for some other guy to come out here and check the, the work that the other guy did. And then after that guy's come out and another piece of paper has been signed, then they will be able to flick the squit, the switch and actually connect this room to the electricity. So that still hasn't happened. I mean, how long? It's unbelievable the, the length of time it takes. I don't know if this is just France or Paris. In fact, I know that in the UK, these sorts of things take ages as well. It just seems everywhere. It, it takes ages for one piece of paper to be signed and to be put on someone's desk. That piece of paper needs to go uh, through that person's inbox and then they sign it and then they send it to someone else and that person finally flicks a switch. So it's, it just takes bloody ages. I do have internet here. So anyway, how's that light working in the background? Well, I've actually got a cable, a long extension cable, which is um, which runs out of my room under the door into the common area of the building, the corridor, and then it, it runs around a couple of corners and there's a plug in the common area of the building. There's a plug there for people to, to attach like vacuum cleaners or whatever to. And so I've plugged my extension cable into that and run the cable all the way around the corner <laughs> and then under my door and into my room and that's how I've got electricity in here for the time being. Now that's a little bit sketchy because it's sort of like I'm stealing electricity 
although uh, I'm not really stealing electricity because as a as as the owner of a of a, an apartment I mean this is technically an apartment is it an apartment is it an office is it a, I don't know it's a room it's a as the owner of a property in this building I do actually contribute to the common fund for paying stuff in the building paying for stuff in the building so you know that is my electricity too so anyway for the time being I am able to kind of like what's the word for it kind of like sneak some electricity into this room and, and, and use it to do things like this but anyway here you go um, I wonder what the sound is like now let me just tell you a little bit about my sound recording setup here so I've got my laptop my new laptop yes finally a new laptop which means I can start doing videos and stuff again so finally things are kind of going back to normal in podcast land so I've got my laptop and plugged into that I have uh, a thing called a Zoom Pod Track P4. Okay, and that essentially allows me to connect audio devices to my laptop. It's a, it's a, um, it is a, uh, uh, a recorder, but also it's a sort of an interface. This is fascinating, isn't it? Fascinating details. So into the Zoom thing, and that's Zoom, it's a different company. It's not Zoom, the ones who do the, the video conferencing. But uh, Zoom are also a company that make microphones and recorders. So that's plugged into my micro into my laptop, and a microphone is plugged into that. Now this microphone is a new one, and it was actually sent to me by the good people at SE Electronics. So a while ago, they were planning this new microphone. It's called the Dynacaster. They were planning it. It was in the sort of research and development stage. And they contacted me because they'd heard my podcast and they said, we'd love to get your thoughts on our new ideas for this microphone. And so, gladly, I said yes. And they, uh, you know, we talked and they showed me the designs and g I gave all my opinions about it. And as a thank you, they sent me a microphone. It was a, a handheld uh, SE Electronics V7. So they sent me a free microphone, which was nice. And then finally, when this was released a few months ago, they actually sent me um, one of them as well as a thank you gift. So thanks a lot to the good people of SE Electronics. Uh, and I'm using this. It's a Dynacaster by Ele SE Electronics. Quite similar to the other microphone that I normally use, which is the Shure SM7B, um, which is a, a sort of a classic industry standard microphone for podcasters. And one of the cool things about the SM7B is that it has these settings on the back of the microphone which allow you to change the sound slightly. And the Dynacaster has kind of done the same thing. They've got these little um, switches at the back which allow you to change the quality of the sound. So anyway, I don't. This, since this is the first time I've recorded in here, I don't really know what it sounds like. Um, and so this is sort of a test. So you can let me know what's the, what's the quality of the sound like in this room. Now in terms of acoustics, <clears throat> it's quite a small room and it's kind of square. The ceiling is quite high. And I've got things on the walls. I've got uh, posters and pictures in frames and books on bookshelves and my guitars on the wall as well. I've got things up on the walls. My desk here is very untidy. I'm not showing you the stuff that's on the side here. Maybe you'll catch a glimpse of it, but it's a very untidy desk. Um, and I've got a sort of a, a little carpety thing uh, in front of me that my laptop is sitting on. But um, with all these flat surfaces, I do wonder if maybe there's a lot of echo. Maybe the sound is rebounding inside the room. Maybe it's going up to the ceiling and bouncing down. It might be bouncing off the walls next to me, the wall in front of me, which has a window in it. Uh, so I might have to do some things that involve soundproofing the room, which means putting some panels which absorb sound on some of the walls and maybe a panel up on the ceiling to try and prevent that kind of boxy, echoey sound <clears throat> that you can get. But anyway, let me know. Let me know what you think of the sound of the room and um, if it needs to be soundproofed and stuff. And what do you think of the microphone? Does it sound any different? It's um, I've got the uh, soft um, sort of windscreen on it. If you remove the soft windscreen, it's like this. To be honest, I can probably record this episode without the foam windscreen windshield uh, on the microphone because one of the cool things about this microphone, this is very geeky chat, isn't it? 
but you know, you're in my pod room and this is what I do in here. I, I look at microphones and think about acoustic treatment uh, on the walls and that sort of thing. That's just that's just what you do, isn't it, in a pod room? So since you're here, do you, do you fancy a cup of tea? You do? Well, um, I don't have a kettle. Sorry, I've got no electricity or running water. Um, there is actually a, so there's a, about the building, I'm on the top floor of this building and uh, I think I've said on the podcast recently that a lot of old Parisian buildings have rooms at the top, which is where the, the staff used to live. So they're these little boxy rooms and often on the corridor um, you'll find a toilet and a, a, a little bathroom, a place with a sink with running water. So there is a shared bathroom, so I do have access to water and I have access to a toilet, but I am the owner of this particular, the, the, the space inside uh, this room. Um, so anyway, uh, the cool thing about this microphone is good, it's, it's got several pop filters installed in the front of the microphone. So pu, 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 mm, it should cope with plosive sounds quite well. So technically, I don't really need the foam windshield. I'm going to try doing it without. So anyway, what do you think of the sound of the episode? And what do you think of the, the way the microphone looks? And what do you think of the way the room looks as well? Just one more thing about the sound. Normally, what I would do is run my microphone through a, um, a mixer, which I use to control things like the level of bass and treble, and also the level of compression. And compression is a really big thing because it helps you to sound like you're on the radio. It kind of gives the podcast that kind of radio production sound. So uh, because I don't have electricity, I don't have the mixer um, plugged in. And so this microphone is not being compressed. It's not going through the compressor. So it's sort of uncompressed sound. Does it make a difference? I don't know. So let me know about the sound and the way it looks. Um, so let me let me show you around the room then. Uh, where can I start? And I don't know what you can see. I can't see what you're seeing. But here it is. The, I've got no lights on except for the one at the back. So yes, forgive the mess. But over, over here you've got shelves. These are the shelves which I installed myself. I'm very proud of my skills. I installed them myself. Listen back to the episode I did about DIY recently and that will tell you everything you need to know about how I put those shelves in. There they are, my lovely books and shelves here. I've got some other shelves from my old room. Uh, a Luke's English podcast sort of light box thing. Um, it's a wooden box with a Luke's English podcast logo on the front and it kind of lights up because there's a light inside. I'm, I basically kind of made that myself. I took an existing box and I... Uh, shaved a bit more space and I got a Luke's English podco podcast logo printed on plexiglass, slid it in and then anyway I kind of made that. Oh brilliant, well done Luke. Uh, guitars on the walls, uh, this this uh, pad here, this um, cork um, note, notice board uh, is a map of the world. This is Lepland. What I'd like to do is at the top write welcome to Lepland uh, on the top of that. Uh, it's quite a nice cork board with a white map of the world. I had that uh, in my other pod room as well. Then I've got pictures, including the Luke's English podcast logo in a frame. I've got a uh, an interesting sort of bit of modern art, which is a, uh, a couple of shapes laid, up, laid on top of each other, one purple, one sort of pink, one orange. And that was given to me by my cousin Oliver. And it's by an artist that he used to know at school. Uh, he went to school with this guy. And what he does is he somehow turns pieces of music into bits of visual art. And that is supposed to be a visual version of the, of the track So What by Miles Davis, which is good. It's one of my favorite pieces of music. And I quite like the way it looks as well. So I don't know how he turns music into visuals, but he does. And that's the result of uh, So What. I can't remember the name of the artist now, but anyway, that's nice. There's a picture of an ear because I thought, you know, since since this is a podcast and you listen to it, uh, listening is the thing. So there's a there's a, a an ear on a, on the back of a sort of starry background, and then above it there's a uh, a picture that just says "Give it time," and it looks like some people on top of a mountain, and it says "Give it time." The reason I've got that one up there is because I think that this is good advice that in learning English you also you have to be prepared to give it some time, time and practice and motivation. 
Then I've got my YouTube shiny thing on the wall to celebrate 100,000 subscribers. I've now got 260,000 subscribers. Uh, but still, I got that last year and it's finally up on the wall. And then above that is a gift that my wife gave to me. It is a map of London in the shape of a heart, which is very nice because that's where we met. Um, this, I've got, this is still not properly set up because, um, first of all, this microphone, it's on a stand which sits on the table, the, the desk. I installed this desk myself. I'm very proud. It's extremely solid. It doesn't shake at all, but it's one piece, one solid piece of oak and it's, it kind of, it transmits the sounds very easily. If I bump the desk, even in the middle, you can really hear, clearly hear it in the microphone very loudly. So if I put my arm, if I rest my elbow on the table, it makes a big noise. And also I've got headphones on. And if I turn my head to the left, then the cable of the headphones taps the microphone. So it's still not set up properly. I need one of those arms, you know, um, a boom arm. So I need to fix the microphone on an arm and have that maybe attached to the wall. And that way I won't get any of these annoying noises because that that's no good, is it? That's impossible. I can't carry on like that. Um, anyway, more books. Guitars on the wall. Um, a picture from my brother. Uh, hands. That's my wife and my daughter's hand prints. Um, right, on this side. Don't know if you can see. On the other wall, I've got some more guitars. I've got another map of the world. I mean, that's it really. Up above the door, there's a, a thing in a frame that is a that's part of my family tree. So my um, my granddad's girlfriend, she was really into making family trees, and uh, she gave me everyone one of their own family trees. So that's like my family tree, and it, it traces my family back about four or five generations, which is quite nice. And then on the on the door, I've got like the Beatles poster and a, a strange poster from my brother, which says, eat your fish. And I suppose the idea is eat your fish before they eat you, which is always good advice, isn't it? Um, so anyway, there you go. I mean, you know, what more can I say about the room? It's only a small, it's only a small room, four walls. Um, the desk, which I installed myself, I'm so proud. I, I, I bought a piece of oak. I, I told the story of how I thought I was going to buy a desk from a girl in an office near here. And I, I, I booked the desk and everything. I went along and she was like, oh no, someone else has sold it. I'm so sorry. And she was so embarrassed. And so she felt so awful. Uh, she offered me some other desks. She was like, what about this one? I said, no, too big. What about that one? No, too small. She was like, oh no, I feel so bad. Would you like a chair? And I did need a chair. And she pointed at several office chairs and I, in my head, I was like, hmm, this could be my opportunity to get a free chair. She's offering one to me. So I grabbed one and then she felt so awkward. We just left the building and she was like, well, anyway, sorry, bye, and just disappeared. Clearly, that wasn't the direction she was supposed to be going because I crossed over the road with my chair, awkwardly pushing it up the road. She had disappeared off in that direction and came, came back. Uh, and had to walk past me very awkwardly. Uh, clearly, she was still very embarrassed because she pretended that she hadn't seen me. She just sort of just walked past me. Like, oh, I'm just walking down the street. How could she, how she could have missed me with this big chair pushing it along the road? Uh, it was quite funny that she just pretended she couldn't see me, even though she had to walk around me. So I got a chair, and then I went to went down to a shop, bought this desk top and a kind of metal rail and a couple of metal legs, and I attached it to the wall, and I felt incredibly proud of myself when I'd done it. So now I have this desk, which is nice. I need to drill a hole through it so I can put all my cables in the hole. I need to attach a microphone arm to the wall, and then um, then that'll be good, won't it? I think so. Yeah, that will be good. How are we doing? How are we doing, everybody? Um, so there you go. Right, I said, what, what, did, what else did I say that I would do? I said that I would uh, maybe pick up a book or two from the uh, bookshelf and go through some of the stuff in it, okay? I don't know how long this will be. This might just be half an hour, which is totally fine. It should just be enough time to introduce you to this small room. Um, right, okay, what else? Let's have a look at some, 
some books. So I've got various books on the shelves, uh, including lots of like old uh, grammar and vocabulary practice books that I used to use years and years ago when I was like a one-to-one -one teacher sometimes. So let's have a look at some of this stuff. So I've got things like, obviously I've got English Grammar in Use by Raymond Murphy, a very old copy. There it is, English Grammar in Use by Raymond Murphy, the grammar book that uh, so many millions of people have bought. Uh, and we've got, you know, it covers almost all of the basics. Uh, very important stuff. For example, present perfect. Let's see, present perfect, I have been doing and I have done. Present perfect, continuous and simple. Anne's clothes are covered in paint. She has been painting the ceiling. She has been painting is the present perfect continuous. Okay, now the ceiling was white, now it's blue. She has painted the ceiling. Has painted is the present perfect simple. Hmm, so what's the difference? She's been painting... In this case, we're interested in the activity, the painting. It doesn't matter whether something has been finished or not. For example, in this, uh, in this example, the activity, painting the ceiling, has not been finished. She's been, painting the, she's been painting the ceiling for half an hour. Right, so it's the activity we're focusing on. But if the painting is done, we want to consider it to be like a finished action, um, then uh, she has uh, painted the ceiling. We're talking about the, the, the result, the completion of the action. The painted ceiling, not the activity itself. Huh? But then there are some cases when present perfect continuous and present perfect simple mean the same thing. For example, I've lived here for 10 years and I've been living here for 10 years. There it's the same. Oh, are we going to get into the grammar stuff? Not now, Luke. I don't think so. Um, but anyway, it's a good book. There's lots of other rules. How about, how about this one? Build Your Vocabulary 3 by John Flower and Michael Berman from LTP Language. This is a, a maybe a book I bought in a second-hand shop at one point. And it's, it's great. It's got like um, each page has got a different activity. The, the one I've just opened here is number 37. Choose the adverb. So adverbs, listeners, adverbs. Adverbs are very useful words, aren't they? We use them to sort of modify verbs in a sentence. We also use them to modify adjectives in a sentence. And the thing with adverbs is that they, they're often supporting words, especially when they go with adjectives. I mean that they support the adjectives. They sort of make them stronger. And what happens is you often find adverbs go in partnerships with other words. They're often found together. These are collocations. So as it says here on page 50, as you study English, notice how some adverbs form common partnerships with other words. For example, the word delighted, the adjective, the adverb is highly. For example, they were highly delighted. And to sigh, that's to sigh, like you sigh when you're sad or relieved or something. And he sighed deeply, so to sigh deeply, to be highly delighted. And if you, if you want to speak English in a natural way, you should note down and learn expressions like this. Word partnerships are an important part of natural English. So from the following list, choose a suitable adverb to complete each sentence. Use each adverb once only. So the adjectives in the list are distinctly, entirely, flatly, fully, greatly, highly, incredibly, longingly, openly, passionately, f perfectly, reluctantly, sorely, unconditionally, unreservedly, and virtually. Okay, so some nice chunky adverbs there. How many of those adverbs do you use? When was the last time you used the adverb unreservedly? What about unconditionally? Or sorely? Or any of them? Flatly, distinctly. Well, let's see. Okay, so distinctly, entirely, flatly, fully, greatly, highly, incredibly, longingly, longing. Mm, longing 
uh, means when you're really desperate for something or you really want something or you really miss something. You're sort of thinking about something. Oh, like, oh, really, I'd love a cup of tea right now. I was longing for a cup of tea. Longingly. I suppose you would look at something longingly, like look at her. Like look at a, a picture of a nice cup of tea and just, ah, oh, I really want that. Mm, or look at a beautiful girl that you've fallen in love with. Not in a creepy way. You're not like <laughs> sneaking in, <laughs> looking through a crack in her door. Uh, no, not like that. It's more like, oh, she's so beautiful. How could I possibly uh, 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 talk to her? Uh, longingly, openly, passionately, perfectly, reluctantly, sorely, unconditionally, unreservedly, and virtually. So, 16 sentences. Number one, the fog was so thick that it was hmm, impossible to see your hand in front of your face. Like, I could almost not see my hand in front of my face because the fog was so thick. Fog, that's cloud on the ground, basically, right? Okay, the fog was so thick that it was hmm, 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 impossible to see your hand in front of your face. What do you think? Uh, fully impossible? No. Distinctly impossible? No. Almost impossible is the word, is, is the meaning. So the answer is virtually. It was virtually impossible to see your hand in front of your face. There's a nice phrase for you, virtually impossible. Okay. Number two, they built up a team of hmm, hmm, motivated salespeople. And by the way, hmm, hmm, is not a word. That's just the noise I'm using for the gap in the sentence. They built up a team of hmm, hmm, motivated salespeople. So not just motivated, but very motivated. So what is it? Openly motivated? Unreservedly motivated? No. Incredibly motivated? No, it's highly motivated. A team of highly motivated salespeople. Doesn't that sound like your worst nightmare? A team of highly motivated salespeople. Just like in the street, you're walking down the street. Oh, no, no, I've got to go to a business meeting. I've got to go to my English lesson. And suddenly, there's a team of highly motivated salespeople standing in the street. And uh, they try and talk to you. And have you ever considered uh, taking out life insurance? And then they hold a knife to your throat. What about now? Do you want life insurance now? Ah! Uh, Highly motivated salespeople. Number three, he hmm, hmm, denied having stolen the money. No, nope, it wasn't me. I did not steal the money. Absolutely not. He denied it. He, he, he strongly denied it with no reservations. It's not unreservedly denied it. He flatly denied it. Flatly denied it. I don't know if we use the adverb flatly with really anything else. Flatly deny flatly refuse maybe it's just poof, absolutely not it, there's no way it was me no way at all he flatly denied it um mm -hmm. flatly deny doing something number four to think he's 90 he's 90 years old he's mm -hmm, fit for his age he's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, fit i think he's like very fit, right? Physically in good condition. Not <laughs> not hot, not meaning sexy. Because fit can mean, in slang terms, fit means very attractive. Like, oh, <laughs> oh she's fit, or oh, he's fit. I don't think this 90-year-old man is that fit. But maybe, maybe he's a really attractive, handsome-looking 90-year-old. I don't know. But anyway, I think it means physically fit, meaning in good physical shape, like healthy to think he's 90, he's fit for his age. I'm sure it's incredibly fit. Yes, it is. It's in, he's incredibly fit for his age. Number five, make sure you're insured before you go. Insurance. So we had that team of highly motivated salespeople. They were selling insurance. So if you go on holiday, you'd need travel insurance. So, you know, what kind of cover do you need? Do you need to be partially covered? No, you need to be completely covered or f fully covered, fully insured. Make sure you're fully insured before you go. Fully insured. Next time you're talking about insurance in English, you can talk about being fully insured. Number six, he something admitted that he was only in it for the money. 
I was surprised at his candor, his honesty. He, he admitted that he was only in it for the money. I'm only doing this for the money. I'm only in it for the money, me. He, he, he hmm, admitted, he openly admitted that he was only in it for the money. Yeah, I'm perfectly willing to admit I'm only doing this for the money. I'm only doing YouTube for the money, for the 29 pence that I will earn from this video. Um, so, number seven. He, she was <laughs> admired for her innovative ideas. She was something admired. So she was admired a lot for her innovative ideas. Well, her innovative ideas are so wonderful and innovative. I really admire this woman for her innovations. She was something admired. Unconditionally ad admired, no, unreservedly admired, no, passionately admired, perfectly, relaxing, openly, longingly, incredibly, greatly admired. It must be the answer. Let me just check. Number 37. Let me have a little look. Answers. Number 37. Here we go. So uh, it's number 7. And it's greatly admired. I was right, of course, as I should be, because I am Luke from Luke's English Podcast, so I should get all the answers right. She was greatly admired. Can you think of someone who was greatly admired for something in your in your country? Um, number eight. She made it blah, blah, blah clear that she wasn't satisfied. I am not satisfied. Who is this girl? And why is she saying so clearly that she's not satisfied? What's the situation? Are you in bed with her? I hope not, because that wouldn't be good, would it? If you just spent an hour in bed with this woman and then she just said, I am not satisfied. That would be awkward. Uh, but what's the adverb? She made it <laughs> clear that she was not satisfied. Distinctly clear, entirely clear, flatly clear, fully clear, incredi long, uh, openly, perfectly, perfectly clear. Perfectly clear. Sorely, unconditionally clear, unreservedly clear. I think it's perfectly clear. I've made it perfectly clear. It's a nice nice uh, collocation. Perfectly clear. It's perfectly clear. I've made it perfectly clear. I think you all know that it's perfectly clear that I am not satisfied. Let's just be sure. Perfectly is number eight. Yes, I'm doing quite well at this. We're halfway through. Let's do number nine. He apologised, blah, 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 for the trouble he had caused. He apologised. Um, mm, he apologised without any sort of reservation. He didn't hold himself back. This is a good one. He apologised unreservedly. So reserve is when you hold yourself back. It's not reserve a table, but reserve is means hold yourself back, to be reserved. Okay? And if you do something unreservedly, is you don't hold yourself back at all. You do it fully, completely. Okay? So he apologised unreservedly for the trouble he had caused. I'm terribly, deeply sorry for the trouble I've caused. I would like to apologise unreservedly and completely. I'm going to put the windshield back on this microphone so I don't have to worry about plosive sounds. So I'm terribly, terribly sorry. He apologised unreservedly for the trouble he had caused. <clears throat> Number 10. They gazed they gazed at the sports car in the showroom. They looked at the sports car like this. Oh, look at that sports car. I really want that sports car so I can do sport. Just get a football. Ah, sports car. I've, we've done that word already. It's longingly. They gazed longingly at the sports car. To gaze at something is to stare at something with love in your eyes, maybe. Um, stare at something with a feeling of emotion. They gazed longingly, like, ah, when will we be able to do sport in a car, in a sports car? Um, they gazed longingly. Number 11. She <laughs> agreed to come despite her misgivings. Misgivings are doubts, um, mm, critical thoughts like, hmm, I'm not sure about this. I don't think this is such a good idea. 
could be a bit dangerous. These are misgivings. And so everyone was like, come on, come, let's do the crazy thing. Come on, let's do a stupid thing. Come on, it'll be fun, we. And the girl was like, mm, I'm not sure, it might be dangerous. And like, come on, you're only you only live once. Let's do it, come on, let's do a really stupid thing. Mm, I'm not sure. Mm. Well, I'm not sure about it, but okay, I'll come. So she agreed to come despite her misgivings. But she didn't just go, okay, I'll do it. She was like, mm, okay, don't really want to, but all right, I'll do it. She <laughs> agreed. She reluctantly agreed. There's a nice there's a nice adverb, reluctantly. In fact, the adjective reluctant, to be reluctant to do something means that you don't really want to do it. So I'm like, I'm not sure I want to do that. I'm reluctant to give my daughter a chocolate biscuit for her snack because I don't want her to eat too much sugar. So I'm reluctant to give her a chocolate biscuit every day, only sometimes. Okay, I'm reluctant to go and do that stupid thing that you are all doing, but I'll do it anyway. I reluctantly agreed. Number 12, it's blah, 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 my fault. I take full responsibility. It's my fault and no one else's fault. I take full responsibility. So it's <laughs> my fault. It's fully my fault. It's uh, openly my fault. No, it's unconditionally my fault. No, it's entirely my fault. It's interesting the way that words go together like this in these partnerships. It's entirely my fault, meaning it's no one else's fault, it's only my fault. I dropped the bottle of wine on the floor. It's my fault and my fault entirely. Um, I don't blame anyone else. I'm the one who did it. Uh, I took the bottle and I let it slip from my grip and it smashed onto the floor in millions of pieces and uh, red wine went everywhere and the other person's like, can you just stop talking and clean it up, please? But I would just like to continue and say that uh, and I, it's entirely my fault. I take full responsibility for the dropping. Can you just clean it up, please, and stop, stop talking about the wine? But just before I do that, I would like to make it abundantly clear that uh, I am in full uh, responsibility of my actions and the wine is can you just uh, what <laughs> strange sketch where a man apologizes for dr for dropping a bottle of wine but doesn't clean it up instead just continues to apologize unreservedly and to take full responsibility and to say he was entirely at fault number 13 the general in the army said that they had to surrender they had to surrender. There was nothing to negotiate. Oh dear. So they surrendered. Like, okay, yeah, we surrender. That's it. No negotiation. Now, in negotiations, normally you have certain things, certain red lines, certain th things that uh, you're willing to trade with. These are your conditions, right? So if you surrender with no conditions, it's like, no, 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 no conditions. We just surrender. That's it. Sorry, everyone. So it would be to surrender unconditionally unconditional surrender or to surrender unconditionally okay number 14 i am <laughs> tempted to have another one of those cakes there are some cakes on the table maybe they are cakes made by mr kipling because as we know if you are a premium lobster you will know that mr kipling makes exceedingly good cakes. Mm, yum, 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 yum. In fact, I've got one of Mr. Kipling's cakes stuffed into my mouth as I am saying these words because they are particularly good cakes. Mm, yum, yum, yum. Uh, anyway, imagine there's some cakes on the table and you've already had one and you're, you're feeling very tempted to have another one. Tempted is like if you're tempted, it's like there's a little voice going, go on, go on, have another biscuit. Go on, take another biscuit. Go on, oh, it's so tasty. Go on, have another one. Oh, I am tempted to have another biscuit. But not just tempted, you are sorely tempted. Sorely tempted. That is right, isn't it? Let, I better check. I'm quite sure that's right. Number 14, yes, sorely tempted. S-O-R-E-L-Y. Oh, sore, if something's sore, like you have a sore throat, right? It sort of feels a bit painful. So if you're sorely tempted, it's like temptation is burning you. Like, tss, 
Ah, I have to have another cake. I was sorely tempted. Number 15. He's loved her da, 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 ever since they first met. He's loved her blah, 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 blah ever since they first met. Well, is it he's loved her openly? He's loved her longingly? He's loved her entirely? He's loved her passionately? Of course, it's he's loved her passionately ever since they first met. Could be the beginning of some sort of romantic story, which I'm not going to do because I'm no good at that sort of thing. Romantic stories of passion <laughs> and romance. Um, and number 16, this is the last one. There's nothing wrong with my hearing. I hmm, heard them say that they would be here at six o'clock. I, I, I clearly and definitely heard them say that they would be here at six o'clock. I distinctly heard them say that they would be here at six o'clock. Is that the right answer? Distinctly. Yes. I distinctly heard them say they would be here at six o'clock. Clearly and definitely. Okay, so there you go. Some common collocations with adverbs from the book Build Your Vocabulary 3 by uh, John Flower and Michael Berman. Thanks, John and Michael. Uh, I don't know if this book is still available, but it's the sort of little exercise book that could be uh, good as a way of expanding your vocab. You've got lots of things. Expressions with on, like on the contrary, on display, on holiday, on trial. Uh, confusing words that sound that seem the same. Formal English, words for hobbies, health, stress patterns, body idioms. Oh, lots of good stuff there. Maybe that book is still available wherever you get your books. What else? I've got so many other books on the shelves. I feel like I'd like to maybe read one uh, passage from one of these books. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh yeah, another thing. Um, so I've been thinking about ways to make this room look nice because obviously I, I want the room to look nice and I want it to have some character but I want it to be a space in which I live so not just designed for videos but designed for me to be able to live in it comfortably I'm not going to live in it I'm not going to sleep here hopefully maybe hopefully not I mean maybe one day my wife will get angry with me and she'll just like chuck me out of the house and I'll be sleeping on the floor in a sleeping bag like ah, podcasting oh, I'm still asleep I'm still asleep podcasting while I'm asleep there's there's an idea anyway uh, but I, I want it to look nice but I've been trying to find ways of maybe changing the color or stuff like that and I bought a little lamp which I've got in the corner of the room here and I've got like a couple of different colored light bulbs now obviously this is only going to work for the video viewers Maybe this will be cut from the audio version, but maybe you could just imagine the sound of different colours. <laughs> I don't know how, but uh, tell me what you think, okay, video viewers. I'm going to show you the, uh, the 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 options I've got. So the first bulb I've got is a weird one, uh, and it's the the first bulb I've got is technically a bulb which is supposed to provide a wide spectrum of colours for plants to help plants grow indoors and I'm going to have some plants in this room uh, I plan to get more plants in here so um, the light is kind of pink but then the edges of the light are green so it's sort of a spectrum from pink into greenish yellow but it mainly looks pink so I don't know I think maybe it's a little bit too pink but you can tell me what you think of this in the background so there you go. There's the pod room with a with with a pink light in the background, which kind of gives an interesting effect. You can tell me what you think of this. Maybe at night time I can have this sort of thing working. So there you go. There's the pod room with pink, the pink bulb in the background. What do you think? Let me know what you think of this. And eventually I'm going to have a plant here, a fairly large one with big leaves and stuff, so that there's some greenery in the background and some oxygen uh, in this room. Let me change the bulb. For my other one, the other bulb is a is a blue one, so I'll just change that now. And there's the room with the blue bulb in the background, so you can tell me what you think of that. So, all right, let's have a look at some books. So. Random book that I've just picked off the shelf is by John Ronson. He is a, a, a journalist from England, and uh, he's got an interesting style. He likes to uh, cover stories of I don't know really like the weird side of life, and um, so 
the back of this book it's it's basically this is a collection of John's writing probably for newspapers or magazines um, and at the, the back it says um, John Ronson has been on patrol with America's real life superheroes and he's been to a UFO convention in the Nevada desert with Robbie Williams he's met a man who tried to split the atom in his kitchen and he asked a conscious robot if she's got a soul Fascinated by madness, strange behaviour and the human mind, John has spent his life exploring mysterious events and meeting extraordinary people. Collected here from various sources, including The Guardian and GQ, are the best of his adventures. Frequently hilarious, sometimes disturbing, always entertaining, these fascinating stories of the chaos that lies on the fringe of our daily lives will have you wondering just what we are capable of. So that's John Ronson. He's done, I think, a TED talk about psychopaths because he was he wrote a book about psychopaths. He wrote a book about uh, being publicly shamed uh, on social media. He's written some really interesting books about conspiracy theorists and things like that. So I thought that I'd just read a couple of pages from the first story in this book, which is about a TV show called Deal or No Deal. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this show is was on TV in your countries because in the UK it was on TV maybe 10 years ago. It was, was when it was most famous, 10, 15, 20 years ago. The concept of the show is that you've got a number of boxes. I think it's like 15 boxes. Each box has got a different amount of money in it. The lowest amount is like one pound and the highest amount is 250,000 pounds. And the way it works is that the contestant ask so so each box is in a row and there are different different members of the public standing behind each box and one contestant at the front and the contestant chooses the boxes they ask the person to open them and uh, every time they open the box they lose that amount of money and they keep going until there's one box left and that's the amount of money that they keep right so they sort of randomly choose boxes to open and hopefully that each time they get the low amounts so that at the end the final box contains a high amount of money now while this is happening every now and then uh, the contestant gets a telephone call and the phone call comes from a mysterious person called the banker and the banker makes the contestant offers uh, okay for example they say if you quit now we'll give you twenty thousand pounds but the contestant might think, well, maybe I've got a chance to get £250,000, so I'll keep playing. You know, they have to kind of make a decision each time based on the deal offered to them by the banker. And it's quite an interesting show. It's presented by a guy called Noel Edmonds, who is a very famous TV presenter in the UK. But he's a little bit odd. And the show is surrounded by this sense of uh, superstition. You know, basically it's random, it's just luck. Like you've no idea which number is in which box. There's no way to predict it or control it. You just pick a box at random and hope that you're going to get a low number, not a high one. But the show somehow has taken on this surreal sort of uh, superstitious element where people are using different techniques to try and get the right boxes. And so... John Ronson became a little bit fascinated by this while while watching an episode and decided to write a, a, a journalistic piece about it. So anyway, I'll read the first couple of pages. So here we go. A young man called Bill stands in the shadows behind a curtain at a converted paintworks factory in Bristol, now a TV studio. To be honest, Bill says, I'm a little bit shell-shocked. This is it, yells a man called Jim. Concentrate, Bill. Hit it, hit it, hit it. Let's do it, mate. Come on, come on. I'm bricking it, says Bill. Bricking it means that I'm really nervous. It actually, technically, it, it, it's rude. It means I'm, I'm shitting it, which is when you're so nervous that you feel like you're going to poo your pants. But I'm bricking it is a slightly more polite way of saying it. The brick in this case being the poo. So anyway, I'm bricking it, says Bill. Go out there, Jim says. Fierce, do it. Be affirmative, man. Win some money. Do it. Positive. This is your moment. This is your chance. Go, 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 go. And at that, Bill steps out from the shadows 
to rapturous applause. <laughs> rapturous report, uh, applause. And he proceeds randomly to open the first of 22 boxes. So there are 22 then. Nine months ago, I was on a treadmill at the gym. So on the running machine at the gym. A Channel 4 afternoon game show called Deal or No Deal was on the TV. I'd never seen it before, so, I, so it took me a minute to understand what was going on. 22 contestants stood behind 22 boxes. One of them, a man called Finn, was selected to be that day's player. There was a cash prize inside each box, from 1p to £250,000. Each time a box was opened, whatever cash prize was in there was discounted. Finn would win whatever money was left in the last box he opened. From time to time, a telephone rang and a mysterious person on the other end, the banker, tried to tempt Finn to stop opening the boxes by offering him a cash settlement. And that was it. That was the game. At first, Finn looked pretty ordinary. But then he produced a scrap of paper from his pocket and showed it to the presenter, Noel Edmonds. It contains distilled wisdom from Paolo Coelho's The Alchemist, he said. I like the sound of this, Finn, Noel replied. You've got a sensitive, almost spiritual side. How does Finn think distilled wisdom from Paolo Coelho's The Alchemist will help him to choose the right boxes? I thought as I jogged. It's all luck. And when did Noel Edmonds suddenly get so mystical? There was a close-up of the scrap of paper upon which Finn had scribbled, Listen to your heart. Suddenly, a trance-like state overwhelmed Finn as he scanned the boxes. A trance-like a trance -like state. So it's like he entered a trance. As he scanned the boxes. What's going on... Uh, What's going through your mind? Noel asked. I'm just trying to let the numbers come to me, Finn said. For a big guy, you're looking incredibly serene, said Noel. I'm listening to my heart, Finn said. <laughs> Box number 16, please. It was opened. Five pounds was in there. The audience cheered. Now Finn wouldn't go home with the paltry sum of five pounds. And so it continued. Finn's psychic trance state turned out to be an, ex an astonishing triumph. He opened the one pound box, the 50p box and the 10p box. Noel and the audience and I watched awed, A-W-E-D, awed, as if witnessing a miracle. The way you're playing the game is actually more powerful than luck itself, Noel said. It was turning into one of the most exciting television viewing experiences I'd ever had. Each time a box was opened, the tension was so agonising, I was practically running a four-minute mile on the treadmill. So he's so stressed and involved that he's running really fast. Four million viewers, nearly half of everyone watching TV at that moment, were watching Finn. When the banker phoned, and offered Finn a huge cash settlement of £44,000. The audience gasped. <gasps> a mystical look crossed Finn's face. No deal, he said, and there was cheering. Yay! And then disaster struck. Finn opened the £100,000 box, followed devastatingly by the £250,000 box. He ended up walking away with a relatively crappy £10,000. Everybody in the audience, including Noel, went quiet and looked embarrassed and even a little ashamed. The mood was what I imagined it must feel like when somebody turns on all the lights at an orgy. <laughs> the fact is, Finn should have accepted the £44,000. Listening to his heart, and making decisions based on psychic impulses cost him £34,000. It was a victory for vaguely negative thinking. My God, I thought, as I finally climbed off the treadmill, exhausted. And so I phoned Endemol, 
the show's producers. I asked if I could be a fly on their wall. So if you're a fly on the wall, it's like you are observing, like no one notices you, but you're observing. A fly on the wall documentary is when a camera crew films something that's happening, but they do it in an unobtrusive way so that the people in the film sort of forget that there's a camera crew there. And if you are a fly on the wall journalist, you're sort of covering a story, but you're not really obvious and people forget that you're there. And so they act naturally. So I phoned Endemol, the show's producers. I asked if I could be a fly on their wall. The show is filmed in Bristol, they said. The first anniversary show would be filmed in, in early October. I was welcome to come along. And so that begins his piece about deal or no deal and following the filming of uh, a couple of episodes of the show and it's very interesting stuff indeed that was john ronson the book is called lost at sea and it's full of interesting pieces and stories and stuff like that uh, so there's lots to enjoy well anyway listeners viewers uh we are nearly at the end of this rambling episode i don't know how long i've been talking for um but there you go have i managed to to complete the challenge i'm sure i said uh a few times um yeah never mind but i managed to keep talking pretty much thank you for joining me in my room let me turn off this blue light um as i said before you can let me know what you think of the lights what do you think of the sound what do you think of the microphone and certain other things i'm working on this place still uh i'm hoping to soundproof it so that it'll sound a little bit better but you can always let me know um what else premium lepsters premium lepsters so premium 33 parts three and four have been published and i'm now working on part five so there's a nice chunk of premium content for you it's available now premium 33 parts three and four and it's 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 good stuff uh word stress rules um what is it that dictates the changes in word stress across a word family and I took a list of 25 words and I converted it into a list of over 120 words, looking at the different parts of speech in each word family for each word with example sentences for each one. And a big memory test. There's a huge memory test of 120 items and lots of comments about meaning and pronunciation and some actual sort of almost concrete rules about pronunciation and um why, for example, we say architecture, architect, ar and we say architectural. Why is this? And other things. So check out Premium 33, parts 3 and 4. They are available for you right now with PDFs and the rest of it. And part 5 will come soon, which will be just listen and repeat. Um, what else? I'm going to enjoy, I, I will at some point in the future, invite other people to join me here in my pod room for some podcast episodes together. Obviously, I've got Amber and Paul, and uh, I promised that I would invite them over here as soon as the room is done. It's still not quite done. There's no electricity yet, but as soon as I can, I will invite them over and uh, various other people. So there you go. And I think that probably if I have the right kind of camera, I do have a, I do have another camera. I've got, we, I've got one of these, which is a Zoom Q4N. It's actually a camera for musicians because it's got decent microphones and it's got a microphone input uh, on the back. The video quality is not amazing, but it does have a sort of a fish eye lens, which means that uh, you'll be able to see a wide, um, a wide view. So if there are three people in here, we'd be able to sit uh, together. And with this camera, I think it would catch all of us. So that's something I intend to do in the future. But let me know. Leave me your feedback. If you've listened or watched all the way to the end, then um, we need to think of a code word, don't we? What code word? I'm going to pick something at random from this John Ronson book. A random word. And it's bouquet. Bouquet. Hmm. A bouquet. B-O-U-Q-U-E-T. A bouquet is a bunch of flowers. So maybe... You could mention bouquets or flowers and something like sending you flowers to say congratulations for moving into your uh, new pod room. Um, you know, I hope that you have plenty of bouquets of flowers there. You should decorate it with some flowers. Flowers or bouquets, that's the code word that you can use in your comment to show that you've listened or watched until the very end. A lovely bunch of flowers would look nice on the wall, Luke, you might say. Okay, uh, but there you go. So you can expect more 
episodes of this podcast recorded in this lovely room um, in the future. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being a Lepster. Um, don't forget, if you'd like some one-to-one -one lessons, private lessons with a tutor online, face-to-face, -face, uh, you can check out British Council English Score Tutors, teacherluke.co.uk slash English. Um, and $1 for your first lesson. It's really cheap because they want to let you test it. And then they're pretty confident that you'll like it. So when you buy some lessons, they'll also give you a free lesson because you're a Lepster. Okay, teacherluke.co.uk slash English. Uh, that's how you get started. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Speak to you very soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye.